thank you so much for joining us on the dwelling show i'm your host all our dances i've got chris with us today super excited um to get on here and kind of hear more about what you do hey chris how's it going going good thanks for having me on yeah so you know a little bit different um for us today but i i cannot wait to kind of dig in into what you do you're doing a, a lot um you're, you're crushing it so kind of tell our, our listeners who you are um kind of what you do and what you've been up to lately yeah. So, I mean, what I do now is, is quite simple. I solve people's money problems by teaching them how to be in control of their money. And I do that in a very simple way, in a way that, you know, I wish more people taught, but it's literally just showing people what the wealthy do with money that you'd never be taught by an advisor or anything else. And, you know, how I learned this, I'll take it back a little bit. You know, I grew up in a, a lower middle-class family. We never had money. Uh, so when I wanted things, I just went out and I had to work for it and I had to dream about it. That was what mom taught me. And as I, as I got older, I got a real job um, at 16 working at a restaurant and they degraded me so badly that I quit. And I didn't know it then, but really what I did is I quit trading hours for dollars at that point and came home, told my mom, I said, I quit my job, thought she was going to be mad, but she wasn't. And I said, all right, well, can I open a clothing line in the basement? And I was going to call it Fat Clothing Company. So at 16 years old, I became an entrepreneur and I knew nothing about being an entrepreneur. I just went to my art teacher in high school, or actually middle school, uh, and started printing t-shirts with them after class. And we printed a dozen shirts, sold them, and just kept turning them like that. 17 years old, that led into the dream of getting a store open. So I opened a skateboard snowboard shop called Fat Man Board Shops, funded in, in part by my mom doing something really stupid and putting her house on the line so that I could chase my dream. And that was the fantasy land right there. That was like when life was just amazing. I was living my dream. I went on to be a pro snowboarder, running my snowboard shops all the way till the, the early 2000s when the dot-com crash hit. That was the first recession I'd ever taken part in. I wasn't making a ton of money, but I, I was saving some. And then the recession hit and all of a sudden everything crashed and burned. And when that happened, I had to get a job. So I was either going to deliver pizzas or go get another job. And I, I landed in Wall Street. Of all the places for a punk snowboard kid to land, I, I ended up being a financial advisor and doing really well with it. And uh, by 2008, I was crushing it. I was one of the top three advisors, making great money, flipping a couple houses here and there. And then uh, the Great Recession hit me, just like it hit so many other people. And it brought me straight to my knees to the point where literally I was one payment away from paying. I, I had a hard money loan out for a strip mall that I was developing and I had one enough to pay one payment. And after, after that, like I lost the plaza, I lost everything. And, and I, he probably wouldn't have just taken the plaza. He probably would have taken a couple of fingers and toes along with it. But uh, my girlfriend who just moved in, thankfully, uh, I came home and I asked her, hey, sweetie, I can't make it. Can you help me pay the mortgage, the utilities? And by the way, can I move a couple of friends into the bedrooms with us? Not our bedroom, but other bedrooms in my house. And, you know, I thought she was going to say no, see you later. But she ended up liking me and sticking around. So that's how I made it through that. And 2009 to 14 marked another interesting time in my life. I had been studying very intently, you know, how to be the best investment guy out there, the best financial advisor. I was really going deep into that. And Warren Buffett was one of my heroes. And he always says, buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. And I took that quite serious. In 2009, I'd just gotten beat up really bad, but I knew that real estate was plummeting in value. So I started buying real estate. Pennies on the dollar, I would buy apartment buildings, I'd renovate them, and I did this from 2009 to 2014, and I got up to 36 units. <laughs> Sounds like an awesome story where I was like getting there, and then all of a sudden, I took my 37th unit to the same bank that refinanced the plaza that did all the other properties, and they said no. They said, Mr. Nago, you don't fit in the little square box called debt to income ratio. We can't give you this mortgage. Oh, and by the way, we're going to freeze your lines of credit. Great. That literally was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, I was pretty highly leveraged because I was scaling fast. And when they froze those lines, I had no money to do any of the renovations, had no money to finish the units, had, had no money to do anything. So I pretty much threw my hands up. I said, all right, it's time to sell them all. And I sold all the properties off. I spiraled. A lot of things happened during this time. I spiraled into probably one of the worst financial positions I'd ever been in my life. I had to 
sell the dream house that me and uh, Larissa, that, that girlfriend that helped me pay the mortgage, she was now my fiance. We bought her dream house. I had to sell that. I had to sell the Audis. I had to literally sell everything, including the bedroom set. That's how bad things got. So here I am. I'm, you know, I don't know how old I was, you know, I'm about 30 years old, maybe at this point, 2014, this would have been. And I was a high level financial advisor. I was very well known in the industry. And how is it that I am a, an advisor yet here I am at the lowest point losing all my money again? Like, what is it that I don't know? Or what am I doing that keeps me on this financial roller coaster ride? And I didn't realize what it was until I went to an event because they were giving away a free iPod shuffle. So I, what the heck, I had nothing to lose. I went. And at this event, two very wealthy individuals. As a matter of fact, I just got off the phone with the one guy right before this podcast. And they were in front of the room and they were talking about real estate and money. But specifically money is what perked my ears up because that was the space I was in. I mean, real estate, I was kind of over at this point. I'm like, screw this. That just brought me to my knees twice. So I think I'm, I'm going to take a pause. But they're talking about money. And all of a sudden, I had this realization that what they were doing with money. I'm listening intently to the different things they're saying. You know, you got to be the bank and all this different stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, these guys are way more successful than me, way more successful than any of my clients that I'm working with or the guys that I'm surrounding myself with. And they're doing things the complete opposite of what I've learned, what I've been doing in as, as an advisor and the same things that I've been doing that have got me where I'm at, which is at the bottom again. So I knew that I was missing something. And what I did is I started following not just these two guys, but all their friends, which were all multimillionaires, some billionaires, started following them around to different events and, and masterminds. And I made this like my mission to crack the code of what the wealthy do, because they clearly were doing something very different. When 2008 happened, these guys rode the ride up because they were buying when everybody else was selling. And, and I started learning that the secret was so freaking simple of what they did different and what all their buddies did and what everybody that I'd been around by asking these questions, I, I just started connecting the dots and said, holy crap, what they do is just one step different than what we've all been taught to do. They're doing the complete opposite, but really it, it boils down to just one thing different that they did. And I immediately found out how I could start applying that one thing, not at a big level, but I started very small and I changed one thing. I changed where my money went first. And then I applied these things that I'd been learning from these wealthy individuals. And very quickly, and this is, remember this is 2014 and 15 I'm, I'm talking about, from 2014 and 15 straight through to today, I have applied these simple techniques that these wealthy families and individuals have applied for decades and generations. And that is essentially what I do today. And that's how I help people solve that problem, their money problems, by putting them back in control, because that's what we've all been lied to about. We've all been I am lied like, to about I am money. like on the edge of my seat of this one thing, Grace. I am. I'm on the edge of my seat. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's just like, oh, here's that one thing. Now, you know, go off. No, it's, it's there's a little more to it, but it really is just changing one thing. And, you know, it, it's so funny because from that moment when I learned it, I thought, okay, you know, this is just something the wealthy can do. But then what I started figuring out is I started studying history. I've always been a history nut. I call me a nerd, whatever you want. I study history probably more than any person you'll ever have on this podcast because I'm infatuated with it, but more so because I've specifically learned being in Wall Street that history repeats itself. So what I did is I went back in history and I said, okay, if the wealthy people today are doing this, were the wealthy people back 100 years ago doing this? Were the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Walt Disney's, the Ray Crocs, like all these, these legends, these massive, you know, these people that had a dream that built these ginormous companies, were they using this? And what I found, and I've made videos on my YouTube about this, that indeed they were. Some of them are very difficult, like Warren Buffett. He was a difficult one to figure out, like, how did he use this? But we, we figured that out. And uh, I've just literally come to the conclusion that, Almost all of us, our whole lives, are lied to. And we're lied to for a very specific reason. And that reason is that they, we are literally taught, like almost just like you know, a dog is taught to fetch a ball. We are taught to give up control of our money so that somebody else can be in control of our money that we work really hard for. And then they know how to move money. They know how to make that money go to work 
so they don't have to work any harder. And it's, it's miraculous how simple this thing is, but it's also miraculous how few people know about it. And also when I tell people, how many people say to me, that sounds too good to be true. So it must not be. So that's my story. And I'm guessing this one thing is infinite banking. Well, that's the process. Okay. So, you know, when you talk about infinite banking, a lot of people think infinite banking or the infinite banking concept is a product. It is indeed not a product. It is a process. It is a process of moving money. So it's just take this money. And how many times can we move this money in and out, in and out, and have this same money continually keep making us money? And there's two ways to do that. Number one is through something Albert Einstein talks about all the time. I mean, you know, he, he wrote books about this, but he talked about compound interest. More specifically, he talked about uninterrupted compound interest. How is it that people don't understand compound interest is something I'll never fully understand, but Albert Einstein understood it. And he said, you know what? It's the most powerful thing in the universe. It's the eighth wonder of the world. So he called compound interest. And then he says, those that understand it, earn it. And those that don't pay it. And we have spent, well, myself, especially up until I learned this, I've spent my entire life paying compound interest to other people, paying the banks, the creditors, paying you know everybody else for the expenses. I, I took every dollar I made and pretty much all of it went to somebody else. And I thought I was getting ahead, but that's why we never get ahead. So infinite banking is the process of moving that money and allowing that money to work for you in a very regimented process. And it's not hard, but it's just different. And then the second part, you know, with infinite banking that a lot of people want to think infinite banking is this, is the machine. So what is the machine where we put our money? Remember that one change that I found that the wealthy did? That change was just this. They didn't want to give up control of their money, so they had to change where their money went first so they could be in control. Let me, let me, let me take you back a, a step because there's an important thing that I got to get out of the way. We all work hard for money. Okay, we've gone to school, we've gone to college, we've all gone through something that has taught us literally to be a good employee and then to be a good you know, business owner or whatever it is. But all of those things have resulted in us going out, working and trading hours for dollars. Not one person that I've ever talked to didn't at some point in their life do that. Most of them still do. And then when we make this money that we worked hard for, what do we do with it? And just for those of you listening, I've been kind of holding a hundred dollar bill. So I, I'm a visual learner and I'm also a visual teacher. So I like holding the thing. It's a hundred bucks. So if I got a hundred dollars, what do I do with this hundred dollars? Well, what do all you do when you get paid? What do you do with it? You put it in the bank. You go to your traditional bank and you deposit your money in the bank. And, you know, that feels good because you're, you're making a deposit. It's an asset for you to feel good kind of thing. But really think about what you just did. You gave up control of that hundred dollars to the bank. And what is the bank going to do? Is that bank going to take your hundred bucks, put it in a little box in the back with your name on it? Heck no. They're going to take your hundred dollars and they're going to lend it out in those little glass cubicles to your neighbor, your coworkers, your friends, your family, all of the people that need money. They're going to take your money and they're going to lend it out to them at some form of an interest rate. And they're going to move your money. And in doing that, the banks, and this is just the numbers by BauerFinancial.com, they're going to make 400 to 1300 percent more than you make on that same hundred dollars. That is correct. Those are the numbers. So if you could just figure out like, how do you tap into that 400 to 1300%, you'd solve most of the problems, but it's not that simple because you don't know how to do that yet, nor did I. So here's what the, the wealthy families did. They said, all right, well, if I'm giving up control of my money to banks and also to Wall Street, i.e. 401ks and retirement accounts, we park our money there and we leave it sit because that's how we have been taught compound interest works. But yet there's not a company in the world, not a business in the world that actually uses compound interest the way that we do. Not a business in the world takes money and leaves it and lets it sit there so that it can earn interest and compound. Not one of them. Banks move money. Car dealerships move cars. Grocery stores move groceries. Get the point? They're all moving money in the form of inventory, but it's the same thing. It's just exchanges and moving money. So if we had a way to just change where our money went first, back to that $100 that we work really hard for. What if we had a different place where we could put that $100, a different place where we were able to put that money, earn compound interest on that money at a rate much higher than what the banks are willing to pay us, but yet then still have access to take that money out and never stop the flow of interest on that money. Can you imagine if there was a place like that? Man, we will. It'd be like finding the fountain of wealth. 
Well, that place has existed for hundreds of years and it was founded like this whole concept I'm going to talk to you about the infinite banking concept as it's commonly known today was founded by the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds back in their, their days because they didn't trust banks. They're in banking, but they didn't trust banks. So they wanted to find a safer place to store their capital. And what they said is they said, well, the safest place we can put our capital is not a bank. It's in giant mutually owned insurance companies. But <laughs> I mean, let me ask you this. It, can you walk into a giant mutual owned insurance company, take your money, you know, take your, your hundreds and walk in there and say, Mr. and Mrs. Insurance Company, can I deposit my money here and get those returns that you pay in those general accounts you got here? No. Bank, the insurance company would say, we don't do that. We're not a bank. Get out. You know, so we had to figure a way out or the, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds had to say, all right, well, if they don't want to just take our money, how do we get our money into their system capitalize on the returns that insurance companies can make, which are some of the best returns out there because insurance companies, unlike banks or unlike any financial institution that there is, they're in the business of long-term return or long-term gains or you know investing money for the long haul. I, when I say long haul, I mean hundreds of years because they're making promises hundreds of years out. So therefore they have to invest out that far in order to guarantee and make those promises come true when they happen. And let's just talk about one of the promises they make, and that is us dying. It's a certain that we're all going to die, and it's a certain we're all going to pay taxes. So let's just try to play within those boundaries because we can't change those. So if the insurance companies are in the business of guaranteeing, well, let's find a way to get them to guarantee a return on our money. And how they figured it out, the Rockefellers, they said, well, the best way to get our money into the general account of the insurance companies is through a product called a whole life insurance policy. Now, all of you, as soon as I said that, don't you dare stop listening to this because you will miss the most important thing. When I say that word, it's like a swear word. Oh, God, the hair on your arm stands up. You're like, what is, whoa, what does a whole life policy have to do with me building wealth? Come on, Chris. Like, I thought you were going to tell me about some sexy new product that I don't know about. No, it's the most boring product on earth. But you don't know how it works because the only thing you know is what your brother-in-law has tried to sell you. And what you also know is what Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman, of which I, I like both of them more so like Dave than Susie, but we won't go there. You know, and they say whole life insurance is a terrible place to put your money. It is overpriced life insurance. That's what they say. And I agree. But you have to then take a step deeper and understand that we are not talking about the same whole life that you buy when you walk into the insurance store. You deal with your brother-in-law that works for XYZ Insurance Company. We are talking about a very specially designed and engineered policy. We are talking about a policy that doesn't even look like a whole life policy because it wasn't designed to do what you normally would think a whole life does. So now that we've got this different whole life, how does this different whole life work? Well, Let's take that money, right? The money we would normally deposit in the bank or deposit in the 401k and let's just make one change. Let's change where that money goes first. Let's take this money and now let's deposit this money into that specially designed and engineered whole life policy that I was just talking about. So what happens different with that policy? Well, immediately you will have access and control of a large percentage of that money right out of the hole say in the first 30 days. So let's just say, uh, let's use a thousand bucks because it's easier math for me. Let's say we had a thousand bucks and we deposit that thousand dollars into this specially designed and engineered whole life policy. And then what we're going to do is we're immediately going to take out 900 of that $1,000. Just stay with me with the math. I'm going to make it super simple. And I don't have enough here, but you know, let's call this about 900 bucks. We put a thousand in, we're immediately going to take out 900. Now, why would we take out 900? We're going to take out 900 because over on the right side, we have a visa bill. We have a visa credit card that we have racked up $900 on. And visa, you know, how nice of people they are. They charge us 20% interest for using that $900. And every single month, we're giving them $100 in a minimal monthly payment. And that's 20% we're giving away. So I want to pay them off. So I put 1000 into this specially designed whole life. I immediately took out $900 and I'm going to pay off visa. But First and foremost, let me go back to that thousand dollars. Well, if I put a thousand in, let me ask you this: If I put a thousand into a bank and I take nine hundred out, how much is left in the bank earning interest? A hundred, if any right. interest. Right, right. <laughs> if if any interest. Yeah. Let's let's be let's be nice to the banks. Let's pretend that they actually pay us some interest. 
<laughs> so you, you put a thousand in and if you take 900 out, there's only a hundred bucks in there, right? Simple math, thousand minus 900 is a hundred. Well, what if I told you with the insurance company, you, and it's not all insurance companies. And again, these are specially designed and engineered. I put a thousand in, I take 900 out. There is still $1,000 in my account earning a guaranteed interest rate plus a dividend. That's right. So that doesn't even seem real. That seems too good to be true. How is it that the insurance company allows me to put 1000 in, take 900 out, and I'm still getting paid on 1000 Dude, that doesn't make sense. Sure, it does. It makes all the sense in the world if you understand it. So who's $900 in my holding? Am I holding my 900 or am I holding the insurance company's money? The answer is, it's the insurance company's money. This $900 isn't mine. It's a loan from the insurance company's general account. Now, as soon as I say that, another swear word. First swear word was, you know, I'm going to play on the strike three. First swear word was whole life. That was a bad one. Okay, we got past that. Next swear word, loan. Chris, we're taking a loan out to pay off another loan with a credit card. Now that doesn't make sense. But this loan that the insurance company gave me is a loan that never needs to be paid back. I did say that. The 900 I'm holding is a loan from the insurance company's general account that I never, ever have to pay back to the insurance company. But that's not really entirely true because the 900 is nothing more than an advance of a promise that that insurance company made me. The 900 is nothing more than the insurance company giving me a loan against my future death benefit that will be paid out the day that I die. Ah, now that makes sense, right? The insurance company has already allocated whatever that death benefit is that they're going to pay out when I die because there's a certain I'm going to die. And I bought that policy so that it will pay when I die. So if they give me 900 today, that means that they don't have to pay me 900 later. They don't care. And they're going to charge me interest on this $900 they gave me. But the interest is not as much as the interest and dividends I'm earning in the policy. So I'm making more on that thousand than I'm paying on the 900. So that's a good day in the office. And it's a better day than being at the bank because the bank doesn't give anything. So now let's go to step two. Infinite banking process is now what we're going to talk about. So now we understand why the wealthy do this, because they can earn uninterrupted compound interest on every penny of the money they put through that specially designed and engineered whole life. Then they can take that money out and use it somewhere else. So let's just keep it simple. We pay off Visa. Visa was owed $900 and I pay Visa off. We owe Visa nothing. Good news is you no longer have to pay Visa $100. The bad news is you should really start to learn to treat your money the same way you treat the bank's money and the same way you treat the credit card company's money. Because if you just paid off Visa with your money, a money that, money that was a loan from your bank, you should take that $100 that you were giving to Visa every month, which was 20%, and just take the $100 and change the name on the check and put it back into your account. And just do that every single month. You would have paid Visa. And when you gave it to Visa, that money was gone forever. And the only winner was Visa, not you. But now, Cash flow stays the same. You didn't work any harder. You didn't work any longer. You didn't take on any risk to do this. You just took the $100 you used to give the visa and you now put it back into your account. What you just did is you just learned what the infinite banking concept is, but you also just learned how to make money twice in the same transaction without having to work harder, longer, or give up control of your money. You actually took back control and you now just learned how to build wealth by taking back the money that you're giving away to everybody else. And if you know how to do that, and you just perpetuated that, and you paid off all your credit cards, and you just recaptured all the money that you used to give away to them. And then you said, well, hey, that was cool. How about the car? Let's pay that car loan off. So we then pay the car loan off. And we take the $500 a month that we used to give to the car finance company. And now that we don't owe them that anymore, we just owe it back to our bank. We put the 500 back in our bank very quickly. And this is what I learned, folks. It looks, I'm telling you my story. Very quickly, what you will start realizing, your bank, that specially designed and engineered whole life, has an awful lot of money in it. And that money, it didn't just appear out of nowhere, but it kind of feels like it did because it's money you were just giving away to everybody else. And then when you run out of places to pay off and debts to pay off, you're like, oh, I'm debt free. Now what? Now what do I do? Well, now you just start the next phase. You start investing that money. I lend that money out and then I take the money from my banking policy. I don't have any debts anymore. My, both my vehicles, my, my wife's and mine are funded through the banking policy. So what I do now is I take my money in my policy, I take loans. And then I, I find someone out there that wants to buy a piece of real estate or you know something like that. And I say, all right, you want to borrow some money? I'll give this money to you at 12% in a first lien position. And then they start making monthly payments back to me 
and I just put them back in my policy every month. So you listen, the, the, I believe it was the Rockefeller said this, and I can't remember his name, but the one Rockefeller said, own nothing, but control everything. We've heard this before, but we never understood this. How I move money today is exactly that. I don't own the real estate that I'm lending on, but I certainly control it. Because if that person doesn't pay me, I'm the one that's going to get that property. Same thing. All the money that I used to give away to everybody else. I, I don't, I mean, I own these things, but now I control all of the money again. And I'm sorry I'm going long on this, but like this is that one thing that I learned. And it wow. was nothing more than changing where the money goes first. And then everything else remains exactly the same as what you're doing today. Fascinating. I've got one question and then we obviously go into the quick Please. rounds because that was so good. So I'm thinking like I own the insurance company. I'm the guy that owns the insurance company. So I've now collected all this money, then giving some of it back, lending some of it back. How am I making money as the insurance company? What am I doing with that money? So I know we know, we know the bank, right? They take that hundred dollars and they lend it to my members and my friends at an X percent, um, you know, interest rate. But me as the insurance company, how am I making money? Yeah. So you're not technically the insurance company. I mean, you're using a giant mutually owned insurance company. So there's a, there's a few of them that work for this, but you're using them and you're just moving your capital, your money through these insurance companies. That's all you're doing. So how are you making money? Well, if you put money into your bank, and then you take money out of your bank and you lend that money out of your bank account to your friend at 12%. I'm just using an example there. That's that 12% is earned income. That's money that you're making now. Okay. That's cash flow. But from the bank standpoint, like if you did it with the bank, you're only making money once. If you change where the money goes and it doesn't go into the bank, but it goes into the insurance policy that specially designed and engineered whole life. Now, all of a sudden, the insurance company is paying me dividends and interest on that money even when I take that money out. So now I, the same thing as your bank account, I took the money out of the, the insurance policy as a loan and I lend that money out at 12%, but now I'm making money twice because the interest is still being paid on the money that was in my policy and I'm making the 12% for lending that money out. So that, I, I hope that answers it. You're, you're making the money by moving your money. Your, your same $100 can, can go into the policy, come out of the policy, go over here, and then on a monthly basis or however you do it, can come back to you systematically until that full amount is paid back. And then you just keep removing that same money. But each time you move it, it's making more money because of the uninterrupted compound interest and because your money's out working. Hey, Chris, that is that explain it? Yeah, that is just really like, it's like a like wow so anyway we're definitely definitely dwelling into the quick rounds these are going to be quick questions quick answer you ready sir i am all right first question what makes you chris unique what is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy or the next girl i don't know if it separates me but i'm that guy that just never was willing to quit and always wanted to create love it next question what was the last book that you read and what was the one thing that you picked out from that book. Holy crap. The last book I read is called The One Thing by Gary Keller. That's <laughs> ironic. And what did I pick up in that book? Well, I picked up a lot, but I, uh, I picked up a story at that end of that book that talked about the one thing. And it really rang true to me. I'm not going to give it out. But if you read the book, in the very last chapter, some of the last pages, there's a unique story about a father and a son. And something that the father does with the son that's just more remarkable. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. So that's the one thing I took out of that book. Yeah, nice. Great book. Final question. What do you do for fun? <laughs> Surf, snowboard, skateboard, and hang out with my little one. I got a 13 month, month old. Oh, so she's nice. a lot of fun. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Well, Chris, uh, like, it's just a pleasure just to, I just listened a ton, just, you know, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you. Um, if there's someone listening and thinking, well, I really want to get with Chris, maybe I want to learn more about this concept. Um, what's the best place people can reach out and get to know you more? It's easy. They can just go to my website, chrisnoggle.com, and they could grab a copy of my book for free, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. 
or they could just go in and sign up for our, we do a wealth webinar every Wednesday. It's completely free. And we'll give you this book, which is drifting away from traditional car buying, teach you how to get all the money back for all the cars you're going to buy, drive and own and do the same thing I had to do back in 14 when I was at the bottom. You know how I got out of this all, how I learned this? I watched a 90 minute video. So in my website, kristenagel.com, in the free resources section, there's a 90 minute video. And any of you that like what I just explained and you want to like really learn about it, watch that 90 minute video on my website. And it's all free. Fantastic. It's, it's all free. Everything yeah. I just said is free. I mean, if you want the book shipped to your door, you got to pay the shipping. But outside of that, everything I get, everything I do, I just give it away for free. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. My pleasure.